The child asked his father, how, how were people born? So his father said, we had Adam and Eve, and they had babies, and when their babies grew up, they made babies, and so on and so forth. That same child ran to his mom and asked the same exact question. The mom said, well, we were monkeys, and through the process of evolution, we became what we are today. So the child ran back to his dad and said, Daddy, Daddy, you lied to me. The father said, no, son, I didn't lie. Mom was talking about her side of the family. <laughs> How people within a family receive the word of God determines whether they will experience peace or family feud. Uh, turn with me, please, to Luke chapter 12. You already know what the major consequence is for rejecting Jesus, but let me ask you this question. What should your response be to Jesus even if you know other family members reject him? What should your response be to Jesus at that time? As we're uh, looking in Luke chapter 12 last week, Jesus had uh, given instruction for his saints to be faithful until he returns. Now picking it up in verse 49, this is Luke Chapter 12, verse 49. I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. For, for from now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two, and two against three. Father will be divided against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Hmm. Would you join me in prayer, please? Father, it seems like we are living in a very divided nation right now. I pray you would help us by your Holy Spirit to understand this passage of Scripture and the wisdom gleaned from it. We thank you for your Son. And Father, not only are his words inspired as recorded in the Bible, but the entire Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable. So Father, may that word that is eternal connect with every heart today, and may we have each heart bow before you as a result. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. May I ask you to start out, is there a contradiction here? Because when I look at Luke 12 and verse 49, it says, I came to send fire on the earth, speaking about judgment. I came, Jesus said, to send fire on the earth. But in, in John 3, 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So which is it? Did he come to bring judgment, or did he come to bring salvation? Well, let me say this to you. The purpose for Jesus' coming was to bring salvation to the lost. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And as we move forward in the Gospel of Luke, when we get to chapter 19 and verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man came, notice the two infinitive, to seek and to save that which was lost. So the purpose for Jesus' first coming was to bring the gospel to the lost. But may I say there is a consequence when people reject the Lord Jesus Christ. The consequence is that there will be division in families. And that is what he's speaking about here in verse 49. Because people need to make a choice. Are you for him or are you against him? And may I say, when you're not for him, you are against him. And with that setting, you will have turmoil in families. It's not what Jesus wanted. In Acts chapter 16, when Paul gave the gospel to the Philippian jailer, he said, you and your household believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And they believed, and I'm sure there was unity in the family because they all believed. 
But what happens when you have a saved husband and yet an unsaved wife? Jesus doesn't want division. He doesn't desire there to be that kind of schism, but people need to make a choice who they will stand with. And so the purpose of Christ's first coming was to reach the lost. A consequence of people not believing on him is that you will have division as a result of that. Coming down to verse 49, Jesus says, I came to send fire on the earth. And I want to point out to you that throughout the Gospel of Luke, fire is a symbol of judgment and of purification. Let me just show this to you, at least a couple of the references here. Uh, go back with me to Luke chapter 3, please. Luke chapter 3. You have John the Baptist, who certainly, certainly didn't fit in with his generation. Uh, he was a man of God, and he told people the ways of God, and it ultimately cost him his life. He wouldn't line himself with the leadership of his generation, and it cost him his head. In Luke chapter 3 and verse 9, John says, and even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into what? The fire, symbol of judgment. And also come down to chapter 3 and look at verse 17. Speaking of Jesus here, his winnowing fan. If you will, they'd have a pitchfork more or less. They'd throw up the wheat into the air. And then the wind would drive away the chaff, and then the, the wheat would fall down. So his winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable, and give me the word again, fire. fire. It's clearly speaking of judgment once again. In uh, another example, in Luke 9, verse 54, Jesus had... Come into Samaria. He sent an entourage to prepare the Samaritans for him. But once they knew that he was going on to Jerusalem, they rejected him. And you remember James and John, the sons of thunder, said, Lord, should we call down fire from heaven? Well, they didn't want to call down fire as a welcoming party. They wanted to call down fire as a result of judgment. And then also later on, just one last reference in Luke 17 and verse 29, after God got Lot out of Sodom, what did he do? He rained down on that city with fire and brimstone. So when Jesus says, I came to send fire on the earth, he's talking about judgment. And then he gives his wish. Oh, how I wish it were already kindled. Well, think about this. As you begin to read the Gospels, it is clear that John the Baptist and Jesus both preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, nation of Israel, bow down to Jesus Christ, put your trust in him and he will establish his kingdom. But Jesus knew. He comes unto his own and his own received him not. Jesus knew that he would be rejected by the nation, that he would have to suffer and that he would have to die in order that one day that kingdom could be established. But he longs for the kingdom. So he wants all this process to continue in order that it might be established. And now in verse 50 he says, but I, speaking of himself, have a baptism to be baptized with. Going back to the sons of thunder, James and John. Mark chapter 10, they come to Jesus and they said, we have a request. Apparently they had watched the Hebrew version of American Idol. And now they wanted to be Hebrew or Jewish Idol. Because they wanted to sit on the right and on the left of Jesus in the kingdom. Hmm. So in other words, when people saw Jesus... They would always see James and John just sitting there saying, hey, we're the right and left hand men. And Jesus listens to them. And then Jesus asks them a question. Mark 10, 38. Can you drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They didn't understand. But ultimately it came to be. Because what happened with James, Acts chapter 12 and verse 2, he was killed by the sword. 
What happened to John? He was banished to the Isle of Patmos as an elderly man. Jesus here, when he speaks of his baptism, is referring to his suffering, which also would include his rejection by the Father. Because from noon till three, there was a darkness over all the land. Why? Because the sin of the world was placed upon Jesus Christ. He knew that he needed to suffer and that he ultimately needed to die for the people. And this is why he says, I have a baptism to be baptized with. You want to talk about submitting to God? Knowing that you're going to the cross and saying, I delight to do your will, oh God. He's fully God, but never miss it. He's fully man. And he knew what was coming. And this is why he says, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. The Greek word distress comes from the, the preposition affixed to a verb, and it has the idea to press together. He's pressed in the same way Paul was in Philippians 1 in verse 23. When Paul was under house arrest, he said, for I am hard pressed. You see the same word there. Between the two, what's the two? You know, staying here for all of you, Philippians, or having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Jesus knew he needed to suffer, he needed to die, but he was distressed because in his humanity he felt the weight of the world that was upon his shoulder, and it was. So he says, I'm distressed. The writer of Hebrews picks up on this even as Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Can you imagine, you, you know that the sin of the world is going to be placed upon you and there will be a separation from you and your Father that you've never experienced before. That perfect intimacy, that sublime fellowship would now be severed for a period of time and it weighed heavily on the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Hebrews 5, 7, it says, Who, in the days of his flesh, see, as a man, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Jesus poured it all out there in the garden, but all he knew, he knew experientially the difficulty of the situation. So here is point number one. Rejecting Jesus' sacrifice results in condemnation. Rejecting Jesus' sacrifice results in condemnation. Why is the fire coming? Because people reject the Lord Jesus Christ. See, the good news for us, Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And think about it with me. John 3, 16 through 18, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. But then verse 18, He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name, see, the person of the only begotten Son of God. So what happens when you reject Jesus Christ? You bring upon yourselves condemnation. And there's no getting around that. I'm afraid in our nation, my friends, a lot of people talk about their Christianity. And a lot of people say, I'm a Christian. But then they make decisions that don't line up with the Scripture. In Galatians 1, Paul talked about those who preached another Jesus, another of a different kind. Think about it. In Matthew 19, Jesus would not be trapped by the Pharisees, but when he talked about marriage, he said ever so clearly, he who made them in the beginning made them male and female. There are so many folks today who are naming the name of Christ, but yet... Their practice betrays the very word of God. So Paul talked and he said, if somebody preaches another Jesus, let him be anathema, dedicated to destruction. We do not create a Jesus, my friends, in our own image and likeness. 
The nature of the Almighty has been revealed to us in the Scripture and we just bow before Him. And in His revelation, when we understand who He is, we yield to Him. And we honor the God of the Bible. And I pray that becomes your passion, that you will never allow this world system, that you will never bow down, kowtow, to those around you for any political reasons whatsoever. My prayer is that you will take the Word of God and the God of the Bible and the Jesus of the Bible and the Holy Spirit of the Bible will be your God, will be your Jesus, and will be your Holy Spirit and no compromise. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Yeah. Because Paul said, if I please men, I am, I am no longer a servant of Jesus Christ. Point number two, receive Jesus' sacrifice despite family condemnation. Welcome or receive Jesus' sacrifice despite family condemnation. A wife and a husband were having a conversation and a wife says, I feel fat. Can you give me a compliment? The husband looked her over and said, you've got good eyesight. That's not the kind of division we're speaking of here. We're talking about a spiritual division. See, Jesus says in verse 51, Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you not at all. But, and it's a strong contrast, division. Jesus knew what would happen. You would have those who would believe on him, and thankfully when you had families, and the entire family or an entire community would believe on Christ, they would have a great unity. And that's what the Church of Jesus Christ, you know, this morning for my devotion, after reading in 1 Samuel, I went over to John chapter 17, and Jesus is praying for his disciples. Imagine he's going to die in 12 hours. What would you do if you had 12 hours to live? He went and he prayed. And he said, Lord, may they be one as we are one. And there's only one way we can have this kind of unity. That if all of us, white, black, Hispanic, and Asian alike, bow down to the God of the Bible and make his word supreme, that the church of Jesus Christ can enjoy a great unity because, see, Jesus knew that when he dispatched his disciples, and by the way, for leaders, if you don't have a successor, you have no success. Think about it. If Jesus didn't have the 12 to train, where would we be with Christianity? If Moses didn't have a Joshua to pass the baton to to go into the promised land, where would we be? See, this is why you look sometimes and you think, oh, it's the pastoral staff. We'll get behind them and support them, and that's great. But what about you? What about your family? What about the next generation? What about your neighbors? What about your coworkers? Are they seeing in you salt? Are they perceiving in you light? Are you getting opportunities to share Christ with them with the hope that you will train them so that one day you can be a success because you have successors? We're just one generation away from extinction. And if we don't do our mission, then we're in trouble. And listen to me, you will take hits along the way. There will be family members those close to you who don't believe on Jesus and not even understanding this, they will come after you and they will discourage you and at times they will attack you. You need to stand strong. You need to understand when Jesus is on your side, you're always in the majority regardless if all the world stands against you. See, Jesus came to bring the gospel, but he knew that some would not believe and there would be a division. And a house divided against itself, what do we learn? Cannot stand. 
And I love the words in verse 52. Because when Jesus steps into our lives, we are never the same. He says, from now on. You got that, everyone? From now on. And by the way, that's a favorite expression of Luke. The idea when Luke uses this expression is that the Almighty has stepped into someone's life and things will never be the same. Do you remember that when you came to Christ? And he's changed you from the inside out, and you're going, it's just not going to be like it was before, with a hearty amen to it. In, in the same gospel, chapter 1 and verse 48, when Mary understands that God has planted within her womb, via a virgin birth, the Messiah, she says, for behold, henceforth, literally from now on, all generations will call me blessed. She understood that the all-powerful one had intervened in her life and that things would never be the same. In Luke chapter 5, same expression is used. The multitudes are pressing the Lord Jesus Christ. He's by Gennesaret, the Sea of Galilee. Sees two boats there, and he gets into one boat, and he says, Peter, launch out a little bit so he wouldn't be trampled underfoot. And he preaches, and he teaches the people. And when he's done, he looks at Peter and says, now, Peter, launch out, and let's go fishing. And Peter's going, Lord, <laughs> should have seen the one that got away. We were out all night, and we caught nothing. But nevertheless, it's your word, I'm going. And Peter was obedient, caught so many fish, and then he understands just how wicked he is. He's starting to perceive who's in the boat with him, and then Jesus says, do not be afraid. From now on, you got the expression, from now on, you will become a fisher of men. In other words, your life is never going to be the same because I'm going to train you how to go and catch people. That's the expression that is used here in verse 52. Now, notice with me, please, the second half of verse 52 and verse 53 because these are very alarming words. Three against two and two against three. So you got five in a house. That's a division, is it not? And he continues, and he gets very specific. Father will be divided against son and son against father. Mother against daughter and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Is that clear? The husband and wife were going out for a rare night on the town. They got all fixed up, and they had called for the taxi to come. When a taxi came, they both went out the door, and they had already put the cat out, but guess what the cat did? Ran right back into the house and went upstairs. And the husband knew he needed to go get the cat because by the time they got back home, the house would be wrecked. So his wife goes out, and she's sitting in a cab, and she didn't, want, she didn't want the cab driver to think no one was home. So she said to the cab driver, my husband went out, went up into the house to say goodbye to my mother. A few minutes later, he comes back, he hops into the cab, and he, he, he looks and he says, stupid old thing, was hiding under the bed, and I had to get her out with my clothes hanger. Matthew chapter 10, and you'll see why I give you the illustration. Matthew chapter 10. I don't know what's coming with our nation, my friends. I don't panic. My God holds the universe in the palm of his hand. You know, you get thinking about this, and in some moments you can feel kind of strong. I remember back in the day and doing military presses, and I could sit down with 210 pounds behind my head, and I could just sit there and do this. Jesus was there at creation, brought the world into existence, and he's been holding it up with the universe ever since. I think he's in control. I think he's powerful. I think there will come a time when he decides to come back to bring us to himself. 
And then you have the man of sin, the Antichrist, make a covenant with the nation of Israel, but we're already with the Lord. Seven years of tribulation. You want to talk about judgment? Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls, half the world's population killed by the first half of the tribulation. People aren't going to walk away unscathed. They don't want Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I'm going to teach you what life is like without me. I don't know what's coming for our nation, but this I know is that we have been given a mission, that the baton has been handed to you and to me, and that Almighty God has enough confidence in us, he says, you are my successor. Because now that I'm seated at the right hand of the Father and through the generations, the word of God has got passed down to you, and it is now your job, it's your mission, it's your assignment to pass the baton along. And can I ask you seriously, and can I ask you honestly, whose life are you impacting? What is the commitment that you have? Sometimes I get discouraged because there's so many folks I reach out to and you seldomly see them. But yet Paul says to Timothy, you need to train faithful men who will train others. I have seven. I have a program for seven guys that I'm investing in and I'm pouring myself into. Some are white, some are black, some are Hispanics because I want them to be here to be successors to me. Individuals who can take, if you will, the baton and run with it. It's so vital to me. I am not here just to occupy space and to do my time and to study the Word of God and to pray and to preach and to counsel and to write just so that I just occupy this time. I'm here to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and God has entrusted me with this mission, but I do understand that there will be those who do not see things the way that I do. There will be people in high places, and sometimes even within your own family, who are going to reject what we believe, and you've got to make a choice. Who are you going to follow? Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, are you with me? Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Well, that's pretty personal, isn't it? It's pretty clear. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength, and you demonstrate that by loving your neighbor, period. Verse 38. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. See, and to pick up the cross was to identify with suffering and death. You identify with Jesus, you can expect that you're going to take some hits. But your life is a vapor. You're going to go from one decade to the next, to the next, to the next. Before you know it, if Christ doesn't come back, you're with the Lord. Is how it works. So remain loyal to the end. He who finds his life will lose it. I see so many purposeless Christians. I find so many people that are going through all these motions. They're going to find the next thing that's going to fulfill them, and their lives are without spiritual direction. But he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Do <laughs> you want to take a chance? Man took his uh, family, including his mother-in-law, to the Mideast. And when they got to Jerusalem, his mother-in-law passed away. So he went to the consulate to see about having her body shipped back to America or flown back. And the consul said, this is an expensive thing. It'll probably cost you about $10,000. But if you choose to bury her here, it'll be only about $300. What would you like to do? And a man thought it over. He goes, I, you know, I really, I, I, I want to get her back home regardless of what the cost is. The consul said, you must really be devoted to your mother-in-law. 
And the man stopped. He said, no. You see, here in Jerusalem, a couple thousand years ago, there was a man who died, and they put him in the ground. But on the third day, he was raised from the dead, and I don't want to take any chances. (laughs) It's so wrong, but it's so funny. (laughs) My friends, you can't take any chances. Rejecting Jesus' sacrifice results in his condemnation. If you're here today and you listen to me very carefully, there's only one way to God. I know we are in a pluralistic society where everybody likes to go, oh, there are so many ways to God, and we find God in our own way. No. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one, no one goes to God the Father except through me today. If you haven't yet, put your faith, put your trust, put your reliance totally upon Jesus Christ who died for your sin and conquered death, demonstrating his God. He became your substitute, and that's why he went to the cross. You could never earn your salvation. If you had a thousand lifetimes to live and you did good works for those thousand lifetimes, you will never merit eternal life because it's a gift. Would you receive the gift today? See, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, free gift, is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Would you right now, where you're at, put your faith in Jesus Christ and say, I receive your free gift. I believe you died for my sin and you conquered death, and I take it to to myself today. See, but we saw, number two, receive Jesus' sacrifice despite family condemnation. For all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And when you start to, at the point where you know the Almighty has intervened in your life, and from now on, you go Christ first. Oh, and you're going to have conflicts. You're going to have scheduling issues. You're going to have all the unsaved want to dictate for you when and how to do things. And you need to become a Joshua. You need to have the boldness. You need to have the audacity to say, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And some of you are too afraid of your families. See, I know something that leadership is influence. And if we can't put our influence upon our families where they respect us, then don't ever expect to export it. Unless we draw the line and say, I'm going to do it here and I'm going to do it now. Why do you think God came to Abraham? Gave him that precious son, and said, now, Abraham, sacrifice him. I want to see if you love me and you believe in me supremely. I will have none other ahead of me. And he went, and he took the knife, and he was willing to sacrifice his son. And then the voice comes, don't do it. Now I know that you love me because of what you have just done. And you take even someone like Gideon, and you go, oh, at the end of his life, he was a failure. That man had some influence. God came to him and said, listen, your father has an idol, tear it down. And some of you are too afraid of those in the family that are holding on to idols to tear it down. You won't stand up to mother or father. You won't stand up to son or daughter. Or you won't stand up to the power broker uncle or the the strong aunt. You won't do it. And Jesus says, if you love father or mother, if you love son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of me. So I ask you today, are you ready to say, I'll tear down the idol? Are you ready to say, 
I will be obedient to whatever my God shows me. And you know, when Gideon did that, later on, when it came time to go fight others, he had so many volunteers who wanted to follow his leadership that God had to dwindle them down to the 300. You remember? Leadership is influence. And some of us need to understand if right now we're like Lot. God says, get out of Sodom. And we go to our sons, sons-in-laws, those probably betrothed to his daughters, and said, God's going to destroy this place. And they laughed at him. They said, your life is such a contradiction. And they perish there in that city. My friends, until you start leading yourselves, and what do I mean by that? Until you start leading yourselves in Bible study, until you start leading yourselves in prayer, until you start showing your families what it is like to be a Christian, you can't export your stuff. You're not even qualified for leadership, as it says in 1 Timothy chapter 3. If I can't lead my sons to Christ, if I can't lead my daughters to Christ, then how am I ever going to come and lead your sons and your daughters to Christ? Jesus took those close to him. They, he said, come live with me, and I'll show you God. Those that are closest to us should respect us the most. Those who know us best should feel our passion. And yes, a prophet can be without honor in his own home. And yes, sometimes people take for granted what they have, but that gives you no excuse to say, as for me in my house, we are going to serve the Lord. And when Jesus called James and John, and when Andrew came, man, they just left their father in the boat. And they said, if Jesus is calling, I'm going. So I want you to do something right now. I want you to bow your heads as the praise team's coming up, and I want you to stay in your seats. And when they sing, I serve.